graphics development on the web is my sort of safe space. I just love to create like interactive things that move to user inputs. S sounds very caveman said like this, but I, I am a simple being. The thing is that in this domain, there is not really any tutorials about how to progress as a graphics developer. More like there is nothing to know what is the next thing to learn about. The next pipeline, the next actual real world problem solving skills you need to have. But going online, finding some inspiration and want to try to recreate it might be one of the best ways to realize what you don't know yet. Recently I was browsing X and I came across this beautiful piece from someone called Pass Error. It's a visualization done with a touch designer and Unreal Engine from what I understood. And my toxic god complex was like, I can do that in JS for sure. And I actually did. And it became by far my biggest tweet yet, which is good for business and also feeding my ego that is already bigger than this project's code base. So in this video, we're going to go through my thought process behind creating what I call the squiggly tunnel. So. First of all, we need to decompose what we see here and assess how we're going to tackle that. So here is Figma right there. I'm going to draw all over this thing. So we can already see, right, multiple layers happening here. And they are obviously somehow morphing and evolving as you go further down the tunnel. As well as there is a sort of like color pulsing that goes from the outside into the inside. And we can also see these things right there that might be really interesting to develop those shadows that are somewhat calculated in real time. So yeah, we need a way to create layers that somehow morph and evolve. More of, yeah, for sure. With this sort of wavy colors and shadows. So yeah, this is what we need to do. So first of all, before talking about colors or whatever, geometry. How are we going to do this? As you already know, as I always say more than 20,000 times a day, there are a Google ways of skinning a cat in this industry. One of the things we could do is in Blender, model a plane, right? And cut out a circle in the middle, having that essentially a mesh with loads of points right there, loads of vertices that we can then move around with some sort of algorithms. We could do that and I think it would work. The thing is, it would be a lot of vertices for a bunch of nothing. Another way we can do it is having that in one single plane and uh, use some good old ray marching to be able to display these kind of things. I am sure you would be able to do that with some algorithms. What is, it? is it cube marching? Can't never remember. Yeah, we could do these things with these kinds of algorithms, but I am very, very unfamiliar with this technology and I don't want that project to take me three months. So here is the idea. I started with a bunch of plane behind each other and essentially I cut out a hole with a fragment shader and essentially I created an alpha test and with some algorithms that I'm going to show you, this is how I did it. And you can just get the indexes of the different planes and plug them, for example, like with the radius of the actual hole itself. The further you go down the line, the smaller the circles so that you can have this sort of tunnel-like vibe. I can actually already show you in the code if I modify it just a little bit. So yeah, I modified the code just a tad for you to see, but like, yeah, as you see, like those are just a couple of planes on top of one another. And what you see here, like the holes and stuff like that, these are the results of some fragment shaders. Well, actually one fragment shader. Oh, and obviously like my code clean, so this is all dynamic. You would like to add a hundred of them? You can add a hundred of them. Boy, that's, 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 that's a thick boy, Jesus Christ. But yeah, this was the main idea. So now, the interesting part, shaders. So the first thing I did was actually, oh, okay. Let me just get off the color also. So the first thing I did was actually creating a hole in the middle of each of these things uh, using a distance function. You cannot see them right now for some very, very basic reason is that since they're getting smaller and smaller towards the center, the last model doesn't have a hole. And since this is like one gigantic color, you cannot see through it. Let me just make them all the entire same size. So yeah, starting with the hole, I did this, right? Um, but as you can see, the colors are a little bit flat. So we're going to integrate what we talked about, that wavy effect. So to do that, I thought about it. And as you know, there are a lot of ways to play with colors. You can pass in an RGB value, a hex value as well on base 16, but also HSL. HSL is pretty neat for gradients because it is made out of three values, which is hue, saturation, and luminance. Oh, that's a good representation. Okay. So on HSL, S is for the saturation of the color and L is for how bright it is. The H though, being the hue, is actually an angle value. In that it goes from zero to 360. But what if you go above 360? Well, since this is just a circle, you're just gonna circle it back and just, you're gonna have back that color again. So 
essentially it makes it very, very easy to just grab the index of the plane you are on. And if you add time to this, it's just going to make that circle all by itself, meaning that you have a pretty good gradient. So in the code base, this is how I took care of it. I have an HSL to RGB value. And as you can see right now, the first value, the actual hue, is passed with the index of the plane and also the time. So when that adds up, it's just going to move around colors and create a beautiful gradient. Gradient that you can see right now. So this is how I did it. Uh, let me go back to the previous thing and actually make the holes smaller as you get further down the line. So yeah, there you go. We got the planes, we got the holes, we got the colors. Now what about that morphing effect we have going on here? Anything that you see that looks a little bit organic and that uses shaders online usually uses some kind of noise. And in there, again, I can be completely wrong, but I am almost sure there he used 3D noise. So why 3D? You first need 2D noise, obviously, because your circle is on a 2D plane. So you need that to like jagged the elements around. And you also need a third one to be able to displace that noise. We can have an entire video all about noise, but again, this is not a tutorial. This is like a small case study between you and I. So yeah, using noise, 3D noise to be exact. If I just replug it back in, where is it? Boom, there you go, it's there. This is now what we have, and it's starting to look more and more convincing, right? But now what's, what's happening there? So it does work. It somehow looks kind of cute right now, but we have a little bit of an issue. It looks way too flat right now compared to the actual first thing that we saw. So again, we can go about this 20,000 ways, but here is what I did. I'm sure you guys are familiar with ambient occlusion in video games. In real life, when you look around your room and you see a corner of any sort, the light bounces around that corner until it has nowhere to go. And so it is darker in these corners. And since we are in real time, we don't have the graphics card capabilities of calculating that light in real time, right? So we need a way to fake that ambient occlusion. And so why do we need it? Well, we have all of these things that are like on top of one another. I'm just going to slowly build this out right there, boom, boom, stuff like that. Okay. And this is the plane that we have. And so we agree that like between these two layers, if you would like to go underneath there, you get that like on paper, there would be no lights, right? So we need a way to make this pixel darker from this pixel, right? And that would give us, I think, a tiny bit more depth to our thing. So how can we do it? So imagine one of our planes, right? Has a hole in the middle. This hole is computed by taking a pixel, wherever it is, and calculate its distance compared to the other pixels, right? And so this is the radian of our particular hole. What we need to do is that any pixels that is starting from the actual edge of the circle, we would just like to make them darker and darker as long as we go on the right. So this is what I did. The ambient occlusion simply takes the distance of that pixel that I just talked about and just takes off that color size that we have. And so meaning that starting from there, we just have a pretty basic gradient that is going to happen. So if I plug this into my shader, boom, this is what we have. So you can see, yeah, it's way lighter on the edges. And as you get further and further, more and more dark. And if you go completely into the edges, this is why it is like completely black. So this is how I did this effect. So what is missing? Now, yeah, a very interesting part. I thought about that. The actual shadows that we can see right there. How can we do that? Coming back to this beautiful sketch that I made here, a shadow is essentially a projection of the thing that is above on the thing that is below, right? So what can we do? What if, so like this is layer number one, this is layer number two. What if we can copy the shape of layer number one here, project it on layer number two, and shift it a little bit. So that would be the mask of the first one put on the second layer. And instead of taking the color, we just take a black color with less opacity to create a fake shadow. So this is exactly what I did. The shadow is a vec three of zero to represent a dark color. And there I just recompute the shape of the previous index. And this is in a big if statement because obviously the first layer doesn't have any shadows because there is nothing on top of it. So yeah, won't go into the details, but this is exactly the same thing as like computing the cutout size right there. And so if I have it at the end, my shadow just takes the current color and takes off a few luminance values. And with that, when you add it all together, you now have these wonderful shadows right there. And boom, we do have our effect. So I could have stopped there, but I saw something on the actual arts is that this is projected on something, right? And I realized I never did 
some screen space projections like that. So it was time to learn some new things. So starting from now, this is my thing. I wanted to create a sort of portal, right? This is the actual end piece. And so I first needed like a little bit of a portal design, right? So opening up Blender, I came up with this little model. There is nothing complicated right there, but this is how I did it. But as you can see, it is separated into two pieces, the actual thing itself, like that I call like the structure, the shield, and the second thing right there, that is a second plane on which I am going to project my thing. I separated them because I will need to make some shader things to that part later on into the code. So I imported my model, put a pretty basic madcap on top of it, and now we have this. So we do have our shield thing with nothing in the middle. Well, not really nothing. On there, I plugged in another shader. I'm going to give it a basic color to prove my point. There you go. I plugged in a shader. So what do we need to do? We need to render the scene we had a few moments ago somewhere else on a texture and plug it in directly into this thing, right? But if we just only do that, it would be shaped very differently because like the UVs of that object right there is not gonna be the same as the first camera, right? So the thing we need to do is do this nifty little thing right there. This takes the position of the vertex and divides it by the resolution. And so we now have the screen space coordinate of our scene. And what does that allow us to do? Well, if you create a render texture in which you render out the layers, draw this thing on top and drag inside of that shader, that texture we just talked about, plug it in with the screen space coordinates. Well, it now feels that you have this sort of portal right there. And there you have it. So obviously this was a really, really fast video to talk about a piece that maybe took me around like four or five hours of coding. But yeah, this is essentially how I did it. Pack it all up, push it to Netlify, make it a cute publication on Twitter, pray and hope that 3.js is going to retweet it and have loads of freelance clients pouring into your DMs, praying that they would work with you. It did not happen. I wish though. But yeah, that is it. The access to this experiment is in the video description as well as the open source code so that you can play with it and tell me what I did wrong and you can make it way better, clone it, post it, make some money on top of it. Do your thing. That is it for me. Leave a like, subscribe, do whatever. Have a fantastic rest of your day and I see you soon on the internet. Bye-bye.